Okay, well, again, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, I will talk about the security of browser extensions today. And it's all based on my master's thesis, so if it comes over as super academic, I'm sorry, but it's actually not. Um, the whole talk is about um, attacks, so it's all from an attacker's perspective. So if I say something like it's, it's sad that something is like this, it's like, of course, from an attacker's perspective. Um, and first of all, I'll go through a short motivation, tell you why you should attack browser extensions, um, and then we'll go to Chrome and specifically talk about attacks on extensions and move on to Firefox and then talk about uh, attacks from extensions. I'll go into that in a minute. So let's first ask ourselves, why should we attack extensions? Well, first of all, if you know some basic web security, you can already attack extensions. There is a large skill overlap, so if you know your stuff about XSS, you can basically attack almost any extension out there. If you don't know anything about web security, okay, you're out of luck, but if you know, you just have to learn one or two new things. So basically, you can already do it. Second thing is, there is a multiplication and impact, because when you own a website, maybe with XSS, you get access to the user's private data, login session, whatever. But when you own an extension, you get access to all the websites this extension has actually access to, which could be all on the internet. Think about Adblock, for example. Adblock needs access to every page in the internet, so it can block the resources. So there you have it, multiple uh, large, large impact. Um, and last but not least, you have some higher privileges. You cannot only access every page potentially in the web, but you can also access stored passwords, the history of the user, and in Firefox, even some operating system features. You can execute arbitrary commands on the OS level. So that's quite bad, right? And then there is attacks from extensions, which might not be as evident that, uh, that they are like something cool to have. Well, first of all, attacks from extensions are a quite natural follow-up because when you have an, uh, an attack on an extension, you could land in a low privilege context. Think about themes, for example. Maybe you have an injection into a theme, and a theme cannot do like everything a normal extension could do. And then you need another attack, an attack from an extension, to go into a high privilege context. <laughs> and last but not least, if you do not find any zero days, no vulnerabilities, you can always go the phishing or social engineering route. And it's, it might be easier to convince somebody that a language package is harmless than a normal extension, right? And hint, hint, a language package in uh, Firefox is actually basically command execution on the OS. So that's quite bad. So let's start with Chrome. And all of this will assume that our attacker model is, is a website. So we have a malicious website, we lure a user onto it, and we attack the user. So what do we have to know about extensions? First of all, every Chrome extension has a central file that's called the manifest.json, and it has all this information, but for us, first of all, only this is really important. Um, I'll go through it. The, from the bottom, there is the permissions key, and permissions tells the browser what uh, an extension wants to do and what it gets access to, because in Chrome, an extension do, does not get access to all privileged APIs by default. They have to be requested. So in this case, active tab, uh, the extension requests access to the active tab of the user. And it cannot access other APIs, like for example, a history API, which is bad for us as attackers, right? Because an extension could like, request only some very uh, benign APIs, which we cannot really use. But that's how it is. And um, then in the permissions, there are also host permissions, which actually declare which URLs the extension has access to. So in this case, the uh, extension says it wants access to all HTTPS URLs. So for example, HTTPS google.com. Um, the key above that, web accessible resources, is incredibly important for us as attackers, because with it, the extension gives us access to its own resources. So if the extension bundles some 
resources, for example, CSS files, images, it can make them accessible to the web. So we can include them from a website, for example. And we'll set, and we will see that in a minute. So let's start. The most easy attack we can do, and which we should know about, is fingerprinting. Um, and fingerprinting is basically identifying the active extensions of a user. So we can use that to discriminate users. We can tell them apart. We can use uh, tracking. So maybe the uh, amount of extensions a user has is quite unique. And we can do targeted attacks. When we have a very noisy attack, which opens tabs, for example, we do not want to shoot it on every user. We only want to shoot it to uh, users which actually have the extension we want to target, right? So the most basic and most easy fingerprinting attack you can do is this one. If an extension has a web accessible resource, doesn't matter which one, doesn't matter which extension, doesn't matter which file type, you can actually include it in a script tag. And the onload event on the script tag will fire if this extension is available, so the extension is installed, and it will throw uh, an error if it is not available. And it really doesn't matter if it's a script or not, it will throw a, a syntax error, but that doesn't matter for us. So we can watch a demo here. OK, nice, I can see it. <laughs> Let's do this. Oh, nice. OK. Uh, as you've noticed, my, my screen is a little bit offset, but we'll work around that. So it tells us Adblock is active. So let's go to Chrome extensions and verify that. So here we go. Adblock is there, and it has this ID. And the website tells us it's active. All right. So now if we uh, disable it, the website should tell us, or should give us, the normal website content. And why does it do so? Because it actually uses just a script tag and discriminate or, or finds the resource of the extension, which is kind of bad for an ad blocking extension if you think about it. Like fingerprinting an ad blocking extension shouldn't be that easy, in my opinion. All right, so that's the most easy attack you can do. Um, and I, I didn't find it. It's uh, common internet knowledge since eight years or so. So it's hard to attribute to a single person, but it's known. Um, the problem with this technique is that the extension actually has to declare a web accessible resource, as you see. So the extension makes itself vulnerable. So what can we do in cases the extension does not do this? And here we come to side channels, uh, which I will not cover as deeply as Timo did. But uh, for us, it's, it suffices to know that uh, we use side channels which differentiate between active extensions and inactive extensions. And any difference in there might be abusable for us. So let's see one. And it's one that works in Chrome and works right now in Chrome. So that's kind of bad. Um, we have a fingerprint HTML, which we will use to open a new window. And the new window has any of the extensions resources loaded in it. For example, the manifest.json. That's always available for every extension. Now, if we redirect the window to a, new, to a file on our origin, um, which we can do because a newly opened window can be slightly controlled. We can redirect it to other URLs. We should be able to access the, the, the file which we have redirected to because it's in our origin based on the same origin policy, if you remember it, we should be able to do this. Actually, in Chrome, if the extension exists, we're not able to do this, because the window gets somehow tainted, and we cannot exit, is, we cannot exit it anymore. So what we, what we can do to differentiate between existing extensions and non-existing extensions is we open it, we redirect, we try to access it, and if the access works, the extension is not available. If it doesn't work, the extension is available. So let's see that in action. This, I'll again do this little trick here. So it, it tells you check for HTTPS everywhere. So let's do this. It opens the URL and tells us 
what's the previous step? So let's do this. Uh, here it is. So it says HTTPS everywhere is active. All right. You'll look into the code in a second. Let's first deactivate HTTPS everywhere and check again like this. And again, we see now, now the resource isn't available anymore and the website tells us HTTPS everywhere is not active anymore. And it's quite hard to see the code, I guess. Oh, this is way better. Maybe not way better. Okay. And it basically does the things that we've just seen. It first opens a new window with a trick. I will explain in a second. And then redirects to this uh, resource. Doesn't matter what this resource is on our origin. And lastly, it accesses the, the tab. And if that works, the extension is not there. There we go. It's a bit dark, isn't it? OK. <laughs> so this is an error-based technique, of course, because we, we work with an error here. And there are others. You can also do timing-based side channels, of course. And there, I think there are actually some present in Chrome, but I didn't have the time to check. And it works for all extensions. You do not have to declare a web accessible resource for it. It works absolutely for every extension, and it relies on two bugs. The tainting behavior I have already explained in the picture, and now there is one thing I did not tell you yet. It's that browsers actually prevent you from opening extension URLs for reasons like this. And we need a bug to bypass that, and the bug isn't that complicated. Instead of directly opening an extension URL, we can just open a redirect, and it redirects to the extension URL, and that works. That bypasses the Chrome check. Nice Chrome, well done. All right, let's get to the master class of uh, extension bugs. And it's actually cross-context scripting. And all you have to know about cross-context scripting is that it's XSS in an extension. So it's basically arbitrary code execution for us in an extension context, which is privileged. And in Chrome, it's, it's kind of complicated. Um, and if you want to know really in detail more about the, the different contexts you can inject to in Chrome extensions, I'll suggest you watch the Kotovitz talk called I'm in your browser pointing your, uh, pointing your stuff, I think. It's a very good talk. And I will just talk about the hardest to exploit uh, context, which, which there is. It's the extension pages. And why is it hard to exploit? Because it's protected by CSP. And I assume not everybody in the room knows what CSP is. It's called Content Security Policy, and it basically tells a website what it can and what it cannot do. So in this case, this is the policy that's imposed on uh, Chrome extensions, and it tells the extension that it can only include scripts from its own origin, so from the extension itself. And what it cannot do, this is implicitly, it cannot use inline scripts. Inline scripts is when an attacker, for example, uh, uh, directly injects a script. For example, the image SRCX on error something, if you know about XSS. This is inline. We cannot use this. And eval is also disabled by default. So basically, for us as an attacker, we cannot really do something harmful. It's a mitigation. We can inject, but the injection cannot really do something. And we can work around it, because images and CSS are not restricted. But that's not what we want. What we actually want is execute arbitrary code. So if only we had a general bypass. So maybe there's something we can do. Let's see. There is a whole section in the CSP editor's draft which is dedicated to extensions, and I don't expect you to read it. What I expect you to read is this, and uh, this is like the short version. And it tells you, blah, blah, ignore extension URLs, blah, blah, right? OK, what does that mean? That means, in this case, that if you have a content security policy that says absolutely no scripts are allowed, absolutely not a single script, you can still include a script from an extension. So that is not blocked, because CSP says, ah, that's an extension. I have to ignore that by spec. All right, So that's kind of good. But still, you might not see 
uh, how this could exploit CSP, right? Because yeah, we can include scripts from existing extensions, but they do their own stuff, right? They do something that's useful in the extension, not for the attacker. Well, there is a way, and I know that this picture might not make much sense to you right now, but tomorrow, at this time, I think it will, after Mario has spoken in his talk, and what I'm talking about is AngularJS. And AngularJS is a great framework because there are actually um, bypasses possible with it, bypasses of CSP. Because the framework is so powerful, you can use it to bypass CSP. I will not go into detail into these bypasses, which you can all see from Mario's talk, I think, tomorrow. Um, but it's enough that you know that uh, extensions, which have an old AngularJS version on a web accessible location, nullify any CSP on websites and extensions absolutely everywhere. And old AngularJS versions, because we're not Mario, right? We don't find these bypasses in new AngularJS versions. We just copy them from Mario's talk. And <laughs> they are for old versions, so. And that's simple enough. So let's see a Vorm. <laughs> it gets, gets brighter. Interesting. OK. I have this uh, extension called uh, Better History, and it's better indeed because it has, wait, it has an XSS vulnerability. So it has a search, so that's kind of the, the one thing where you should always look, right? So if you use a B tag, that works. So for example here, that's fat, all right, so that's good. But as I said, the CSP prevents uh, a regular payload. I can make this bigger a little bit. So let's see if I wrote that correctly. Uh, yep, I think I did. Um, and this will not work. Let's shoot it. It's in there, and it's in the HTML, but it gets mitigated by CSP, because C CSP says, uh-uh, no scripts. So let's find a way around this. Here is a very, very uh, interestingly, interestingly designed website, which asks me to right-click it and open in a new tab. So let's do this first and then look at it. All right, like this. And all of a sudden, whoa, alert one pops up. All right, OK, let's explain this. Um, the first thing you will not see, because it's way too small, is that the extension can be triggered from the URL. So it's up in here, something like hashtag search and then something. So that's quite good for us as an attacker, so we can trigger it from outside. Well, the second thing is now we can inject our cool payload. Um, so it's first the, the extension, it's first the injection, which is search, and then SRC, Chrome extension something. And um, it first includes an AngularJS version from another extension. The first I found, it's called save list, whatever. But it has AngularJS on a web accessible location, which is good for us. Um, and then it uses uh, AngularJS bypass, which I will not talk about. That's Mario's domain. And I will talk some strange things about it. So. Um, and why should we right-click it? Well, that's another bug by Chrome, well done. Um, because if you, if you do a normal click, it actually blocks it, the browser blocks it, because, you know, extension, extension URLs are bad, so we should prevent a user from clicking extension URL links, right? But as you've seen, uh, right-click and open in a new tab works quite well. So the check is just for a normal click. And now, guess what? What happens if I CTRL click? You know that CTRL click is basically open a new tab? Guess what? It doesn't work. <laughs> because I don't know. Who knows? Like this, and it doesn't work. Who knows? But right click and open a new tab works, so that's fine. Well done, Chrome. I think I'll leave it uh, like this because it's a little bit brighter. OK, there we go. So we have that. And that, that's what we've seen. 
it had an XCS vulnerability. Now, the people that know about these AngularJS bypasses know that uh, uh, the bypass that I have used actually requires eval to be available. And I've just told you that CSB disables it by default, but the extension actually re-enables eval. But stay alert, no eval vuln in the extension itself. It's just that it allows us to use more bypasses. So that worked. So let's go into Firefox and now to uh, attacks from extensions. And let's start a bit uh, with theory. Um, in, in Firefox, we have a huge number of different extension types. For example, complete themes, locale packs, whatever, and the group that I call regular extensions. And I've grouped them together because they have an interesting property. They're all signed. Mozilla started signing extensions some months ago, or maybe half a year ago, and it has impact on us as attackers, because we, now we have to upload all these extensions that need to be signed to Mozilla, and they can review them. So if you want to do something malicious, we cannot, because the browser will just reject our add-ons. So maybe we have to evade to the other uh, types of extensions, which are not signed yet. So let's try that. But first, we have to understand one basic thing about uh, Firefox extensions, and this is that the privileges are bound to the URLs inside of the browser. And basically, everything that runs under Chrome something content is privileged, and it can access all the APIs. It is not like as fine nuanced as Chrome is. It can directly access everything. And everything that runs on the skin is slightly privileged. I'll not go into detail here, but it cannot directly access the privileged APIs. So basically, themes cannot directly access privileged APIs, can do some other stuff, but it's not interesting for us now. And resource, for example, is not privileged. So let's see. Um, extensions, or ex uh, legacy extensions in particular, use this one file, which declares which URLs it has. And it's called Chrome Manifest. And the regular extensions can actually register all of these URLs. So uh, for example, Adblock Plus can uh, register content URLs, locale URLs, skin URLs, whatever, everything, because it's privileged. It can do everything. Now, themes are restricted to skin origins. They can only register skin packages, which are, as we've just seen, only slightly privileged. And locale packs can, of course, register locale origins, and for some reason also skin, and some other stuff, which I will get into in a second. And let's use this knowledge to create an attack. But let's first know what we can do if we have it. Like, we have to know the consequences, right? So the consequences have been found out by uh, Malarish on, on, on Twitter, and it's basically really bad. It's really, really bad. Privilege code can read files, read stored passwords, execute OS commands, um, without any exception, so we want actu we actually want that. And basically, what the Mozilla documentation tells you is only regular extensions can do this. The class that's signed right now, or can it? Well, there is an attack which is easy to explain. It's privilege escalation we get from less privileged context to privileged context. Let's try that. And there is something interesting in locale packs. We remember that. All the privilege is bound to the URL, right? So actually, there is a mechanism to override URLs in a manifest file. So all you have to do is basically register any unprivileged origin and then override a privileged URL with it, and that's it. Now you're executing under a privileged URL, and you have full privilege. That's it. It's simple as that. And basically, that means that locale packs can absolutely escalate privileges, so they're not just language packages, which, are, which they are marketed at. So your browser UI shows them as languages. Um, they can actually do anything. And that means that Mozilla started to sign them now. Um, I think, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the one that, that made them do, the, do it, but um, I reported the bug and they were like, that's no problem, we signed them. And somebody else was answering, no, we don't yet. Um, so <laughs> they were kind of, you know, whatever. Um, and there's at least two variants to do it. So 
locale packs, bad, bad. So the last thing I want to talk about is how um, the extension system actually affects browser bugs. Because if you find a browser bug, it might not enable you to do a, a remote code execution right away. You might have to do some, some tricks. And actually, the extension system can be very helpful for that. So let's see a bug that I've found. This is, again, CSP. So you know this already. But one thing I have not told you about yet is the report UI functionality. And it's basically, if your website violates this policy, you can uh, tell the browser to send your report. And this report will have some, like, the violation in it. Now, you see it's an HTTP URL. You can send it to HTTP URLs. And well, what happens if you use a file URL or a Chrome URL? Well, I, I really didn't think that something would happen. But basically, what the browser did is create new files on the file system <laughs> for some reason, or o overrode files even. So uh, that was quite bad. And let's see. We have a demo. What? Okay, this is still Chrome, so it doesn't work, but let's see Firefox. So first of all, let's go into uh, temp. This will be kind of hard with this setup now, where you don't see anything, but I think you see. It. Um, in temp, there is absolutely nothing. So now let's enter the evil URL, which tells us uh, road file to temp, whatever. And we see there is a CSP report. Cool. So let's see. And there is a report in there. Firefox created a file for us. Nice. Thank you, Firefox. OK. So what can we do with it? Like, overwriting files is bad enough, right? We can dust some files, which we know. And uh, yeah, but this is not the end of the story. The first thing we can do with it is disable extensions. Because, because Mozilla has enabled signing, we can now disable extensions, because we can write to Chrome URLs. Now, any extension which we write a file to will have an invalid signature, and that will disable it. So basically. We can disable any extension of the user, some security extension, for example, no script. But this is still not the best thing we can do. The best thing we can do is actually hijack extensions, but only in some cases, sadly. So if the signing is disabled, if a user has an even older Firefox, maybe Firefox 42 or so, or has it in disabled by himself because he's a developer or so, we can actually get code exec and privilege code exec with it. And now, for that, we actually have to look at the report format itself. This is basically the code that I'm using. It's telling the browser to not allow any script uh, and use as a report URL of a file. And then it can have inside of the script text some other script stuff. And you'll see that it gets like written to the uh, J uh, JSON report like that, like without any escaping or so. So that means. If you open the JSON report as HTML, the alert box will pop. But that's still not enough, because we only have 40 chars in this, in this, uh, inside of these script tags. So that's not enough to do something really evil. So we have to do something better. So now we also can use a nonce in there to have some more chars. And with that, we can create a payload that uh, includes an external script from anywhere. It just has to be under 40 chars. And then the script gets closed somewhere behind it. But you know, browsers are very lax in parsing. They say, yeah, that looks about right. That looks good. So let's see that. First, open it here, or else I won't be able to copy it. OK. There is this, um, there is this extension. It's called what? Oh, where is it? There it is. Oh, it doesn't open. No. Oh, there it is. Nice. Okay. And it tells you, it, it will tell you how evil a website is. So I thought it would be funny to exploit it. 
So what it does is actually it displays the HTML page in your browser UI. So um, let's first watch the payload, which we will use, because that's kind of interesting before we use it. So you see that I don't trick you or so. Um, So that's the payload. We cannot pop an alert box because uh, it's in a hidden Firefox window and that cannot open alert boxes. But what we can do is write another file, for example, to the this only that you see that privileged, um, privileged code execution is actually possible. And this file won't have this whole report thing in it. There will be just something super evil in there. OK, let's try. Which could also be a binary. And you can execute it in the next step, for example. Oh, that would be a good puck. Yeah, whatever. Um, let's do this first. We have the URL. I hope I still have it saved. We go on this thing. It tells us done. All right. And now, uh, one thing you have to know is that Firefox actually caches the UI. So this hasn't changed in any way. So we have to restart the browser, which will be kind of interesting with this setup. Well, let's try. OK. So I've restarted the browser. Here it is. Let's see in temp if you have written the file. And yeah, there is exploit works. And there is something super evil in there. So it's not the whole report. Our privilege coach has written it. And the user can now see this uh, enhanced version of this add-on, which looks like this. It, <laughs> you can actually see that the HTML got interpreted and executed. So good. This. OK, let's get to a conclusion. Um, the main part is that many of these attacks are kind of old. People have found them five years ago, six years ago, whatever. But browsers started to mitigate them. And the point is, nowadays, you require browser bugs to re-enable them. And one browser bug is, for example, this opening a URL, a Chrome extension URL. That's one of the master bugs. With those bugs, you can do <laughs> A lot of things trigger many bugs. And you actually require them nowadays. Um, another thing you can absolutely see in this thesis is that extensions and CSP don't go well together. And, it, and if there's one thing you remember from this talk, it should be that Chrome uh, or extension URLs, also in Firefox, are always exempt from the CSP. So there is your free bypass in most of the cases. Um, and there is, of course, still lots of quirky behavior in browsers, which uh, I haven't talked about. And I will release a test suite, which you can use to look into other issues, I hope. And thank you for your attention, actually.